DC Universe announces launch date, reveals new Titans images. That is the headline on this week's Movie Burner News. And joining us as always is John, and we're going to delve right into this. This comes from a report from Collider.com, John, in regards to new images for the upcoming Titan series. We have looked at um, both the uh, trailer for this, uh, which was out, I think, at Comic-Con last month. Yes. Um, and also there's a little clip from the Young Justice Outsiders in there as well. It's an animated film, I think, as it um, it's coming out very shortly as well. But uh, what's your thoughts on, first and foremost, these images that we're seeing uh, that have been released, John? Yeah, I mean, they look okay. They look okay. They look dark. They look gritty. But they look as though it's maybe been done by someone that they've paid on Deviant Art or something. <laughs> An aspiring digital artist who's fired in uh, an overlay on all of these photographs. Uh, they all look kind of a similar. Uh, I guess they're showing us something of the characters. You look at the, I believe it's Starfire. Uh, we see Beast Boy as well, sitting very ominously near him. I don't know, he looks very angsty. They all look very angsty, and truth be told. Uh, when I first seen Beast Boy, I actually thought it was Benicio Del Toro, and I was like, what the hell is Benicio Del Toro doing in this bizarre DC Titan series? But no, nope, it's not. It's some other guy. I believe it's Ryan Potter. Uh, so yeah, Starfire looks pretty cool. She's been getting battered in some of the comments I've seen, saying that she looks like a hooker. Don't see that at all. I think she looks very cool indeed. Some of the effects I thought were okay. They were getting tanned as well. Uh, you see Raven as well, played by Tegan Croft. She looks okay too. She kind of reminds me of that antenna thing that pops up in Guardians of the Galaxy. I always forget her name. <laughs> she reminds me of her. But yeah, the coolest by far is without a shadow of a doubt, um, Dick Grayson, aka Robin, played by Brenton Thwaites. Thwaites, I can't say the name. He is by far the coolest of them all. I think the suit looks very cool. He's got his own uh, blade thing that he throws. I don't know what that's called. Obviously, Batman's got it. Uh, certain iterations of Batman have got that bat thing that he throws. Uh, I think he looks very, very cool indeed. Uh, he says, obviously, fuck Batman in the trailer as well. That's very controversial. He raised you, Robin, or Dick Grayson, or whatever the hell you're masquerading as these days. Don't be disrespectful. And I hope now that Batman pops up in a cameo and slaps you down now, you little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks okay, man. It's a bit... Mm. It's a bit samey, but yeah, I mean, they look cool enough. Well, the trailer I thought was actually quite decent, Stephen. I don't know well, well, the hate it's getting. The, the funny thing is, John, I looked at these, these uh, images that yeah. are on the Collider website, and um, yeah, I was thoroughly impressed with the artwork on these. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, very dark, but the four characters, uh, well, maybe three out of the four reminded me of other characters. That top one reminds me of um, Storm from X-Men. Yes. The third one down uh, reminds me of a combination of that antenna girl we see in uh, Guardians of the Galaxy <laughs> yeah. and Hit Girl from the Kick-Ass films. And something from The Conjuring 2 with all those crosses in the room. That's yeah, and, and I say, this Beast Boy just looks like Beast from X-Men, although yeah. he's green rather than blue. But um, nevertheless, um, I was very impressed with these images. Yeah. Not so much the trailer. Um, the trailer, the trailer, to me, was trying to be something that it's not. It mm. came more across of um, more. I think it was you who said it's uh, quite angsty, yeah. which I agree with. But I think it had a kind of a twilight vibe off yeah. it as well. These deep, meaningful characters that have all got these relationships and all this kind of thing. They're comic book characters. Let's just have some fun with them. Um, it just looks like try to be too gritty. Yeah, definitely um, darker. The other, the other trailer um, that came out was the Young Justice Outsiders. Oh, it's very cool. Yeah, um, this was um, it's in its third season. Apparently, I, I've totally missed this one. Um, I'm actually going back and doing a marathon of the DC animated films at the moment. So, um, excuse my my ignorance on this series. I actually quite liked the animation in this clip. It's the first time I've seen it. Um, but I think um, once I've, I've done my rounds on the animated films, it's something I think I'll go back and check. Um, certainly it's in its third season now, and I think by the time you know I, I finish watching all the movies, um, I'll be ready to, to watch this. Yeah, f- just sitting watching uh, a little bits of these this trailer just now, things I didn't actually get a chance to look at it, but it does, it looks very cool. The animation looks slick, looks very much like some of the films that you have been watching from a DC animated uh, film universe. It's a very cool uh, animation style uh, they're using here. But I love the little things that are coming up from his device that he's got, the, the overlay things showing him uh, different information and stuff like that. It's cool. I've, I can't really judge it because I've never seen it. Uh, but certainly the 
photographs they look interesting the trailer yeah I can get on board with what you said Stephen it's kind of a trying too hard to be dark and gritty like the films I thought they would want to get away from that Warner Brothers after the criticisms that the, the DC universe got for being too dark and gritty they, I would have thought they'd have tried to have done a live action version of the Teen Titans Go series which by all accounts is very funny very light uh, in tone but I don't know whether that's still going on in the background and this is them trying to differentiate themselves from this by going in a completely different direction but certainly Robin's sequence was pretty cool he drops down shouts, shouts fuck Batman at some point drops down beats the shit out of all those guys and yeah it kind of put me in mind of uh, the new mutants where it's almost horror aspects to it. I don't know if that's true or not but it's yeah very angsty yeah, they all look pretty samey to be fair the Raven character apparently she doesn't have a relationship at all with Robin in any of the comic book runs but they're trying to force feed that in the trailer, so I don't know what to make of that. But certainly the comic book run is apparently it was very, very successful back in the 60s. It's one of the more enjoyable ones. Uh, so they're trying to adapt this, so hopefully they've took some of the best bits out of it. The trailer's nothing to go by, and it's actually very decent, because I would give it a watch. Just talking about this streaming service in itself, I didn't actually know anything about this DC streaming service. I can't lie. It seems like we're getting all these different streaming services popping up. We've got Netflix, we've got... Disney launching theirs, we've got DC launching a separate streaming service, there's going to be a lot of people out of a hard earned cash going to all these streaming services, I don't know how dear it is I don't know anything about it whether it's even coming over here, whether we'll have it popping up in something separate, Lord only knows but one of the things I did uh, quite enjoy uh, was seeing that they're doing a daily show or something, DC Daily or something, where it's going to be Tiffany Smith and Sam Levine and stuff like that talking about all the, the latest comic book news from the world of DC. That's intrigued me. That's very interesting because as someone who would love to get into reading comics, I'd love to hear it from people who are very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about it and they can pop in some perils of wisdom So, what's best to read and what's the best thing to come into. So that's intriguing. Yeah, this Titan show looks like it may be the start of something bigger that they're going to start rolling out. Also, Marvel have got their uh, stuff. I think we'll see the likes of Arrow coming in here too, the likes of... Uh, the Flash and stuff popping over to this streaming service and it may all interconnect it does say that John Barrowman will pop up in the DC Daily as well so it's all very intriguing um, I'm not panning it the way some people are obviously DC fans are very particular about the way they want these characters handled as someone who's never seen Teen Titans go doesn't know much about the Titans characters at all they looked okay a little bit samey a little bit angsty but for the most part they looked okay I think it makes sense that DC should have a streaming service, John. They've got plenty of content out there, as you said. Yeah. Um, in regards to um, this uh, series being interconnected with Arrow, uh, the Arrowverse or whatever they call it, um, I, I can't really see that, to be honest yeah. with you, because they, they missed their opportunity with the fabulous television series Gotham mm. to interconnect with that, but it's a totally different, separate thing. I forgot all about um, Gotham, Stephen. Um, That'll come over as well. Certainly well, John. You're right, and I think... Um, when you look at the previous movies that DC have released, I think they will all be housed under this as well. It's interesting to see they're going to have a daily show. I think that will be quite interesting to, to view, um, and, you know, and have guests like John Barrowman on, who's a big comic book fan as well. Um, he, he was fantastic in Arrow, yeah. and um, I thoroughly enjoyed the Arrow television series and the Flash television series as well. I think around to seeing Supergirl, but it was all interconnected in that sort of way um, they were all part of the same world it's slightly different to um, what Marvel are doing with the Netflix um, television series um, where they've taken these four or five sort of sub characters I don't want to really belittle these characters because they're fantastic the likes yeah. of Daredevil and Luke Cage and that are absolutely amazing um, but they're all inter- interconnected um, it's like a sort of scaled down version of the MCU yeah. um, whereas DC are a little bit more disjointed as I said you know Arrow, Flash, Supergirl are all interconnected. Gotham's a standalone thing altogether. The quality is very similar. Um, but I don't see um, this uh, new series, Titans, being interconnected with it. I think it's going to do its own thing. Um, Young Justice, the television series, has been running since 2010, John. It's uh, 72 episodes in. I didn't know anything about <laughs> yeah. this, I've got to be honest with you. But um, just looking at some of the cast in that as well, um, you've got the likes of Bruce Greenwood, who's no stranger to playing Batman. Yeah. Um, you've also got Alan Tudyk in there as well, um, as we know, he's a great actor. Yeah. Uh, the, the late, great Miguel Ferreira, who played uh, 
Bob Morton on the the first Robocop movie as well. Mm-hmm. He He's in there as well, and the list just goes on and on. Some of them I recognise from the DC films. Uh, Tim Curry as well, he's in there as well. Um, terrific cast. It's something that I think I will go back. Um, I wasn't aware of this, um, to be honest with you. I don't know what channel uh, it would be on over here in the UK anyway, um, but certainly I don't think we get as much exposure to these television series as our US counterparts. Seems like it's... Maybe on Amazon, Stephen, I think it may be on that, their streaming service. I don't know if that's true, though. But certainly, uh, I think this new Titan series is going to be much like what Marvel are doing. This is smaller, superfluous characters that are not going to pop up in the main DC universe. But listen, um, it looks okay to me. I would probably give it a watch if I could get my hands on it. I don't know if I would want to subscribe to yet another streaming service. Um, but certainly, there's certain little bits in this... Uh, news that have got me intrigued and if it's cheap enough I may give it a bash as she says that uh, animated series Young Justice looks very good indeed as well so I'd maybe go and give that a watch at some point but yeah I've not got much more to add it's all intriguing I didn't know anything about it so it's news to me it surprised me until you told me there Stephen I didn't know anything about it at all but I think we're going to move on to the next topic which is all about Operation Finale and it's box office performance it's just released in the United States we have to wait a week longer and it's picked up one million dollars on the, the Wednesday there, so it's opened in one thousand eight hundred and eighteen locations. I don't know if that's good or bad, Steve. <laughs> it's a smaller film. Yeah. It flew under the radar. I didn't even know of its existence until a couple of weeks ago. It's also all about Ben Kingsley playing Adolf Eichmann, Oscar Isaac playing uh, an Israeli uh, prominent Jew that was hunting them down. This was set, I believe, in the fifties after World War Two. Adolf Eichmann was uh, one of the main architects of Holocaust, the final solution, and they hunt him down, and it's all about that story. He, Isaac plays a Mossad agent who hunts him down, brings him back, and he's obviously trialled and then killed. <laughs> Not giving the story away there, I hope, but yeah, it's an intriguing concept. I love history, I love World War II, all the things that come out of it, so I will definitely be watching this when it comes out over here, and I'm pleased to see it's doing reasonably okay. Yeah, it doesn't sit well when you say, John, you loved World War Two, but I understand what you mean. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I'm the same. You know, I'm very interested in that part of history. We talked about this, we talked about the trailer, actually, yeah. uh, I think about maybe a month ago. I think it was two trailers, actually. And very intriguing, Ben Kingsley playing uh, Adolf Eich- Eichmann. Yes. Um, you know, I don't think it's a, a character that's been overly um saturated throughout um, movie history or television history mm-hmm. certainly the history books uh, if you're really into this type of thing you know who he was and he's part in the, the you know the whole um, regime and uh, you know Oscar Isaac as well um, I think this is going to be very interesting um, I'm very interested to see Isaac's um, portrayal in this film as well in regards to the box office John it's very impressive for a very under the radar type movie it, I don't think it got a lot of um, publicity. Yeah. Uh, there was not a lot of uh, marketing, uh, certainly not in this country anyway. I think it was yourself that actually um, pointed me in the direction of this movie. Yes. Um, I didn't know anything about it till you, you told me about it and then I watched those two trailers and I was very intrigued, as I said. Um, will we be talking about it on Box Office Chat in the next few weeks? I, I don't know. I doubt it very much, I've got to be honest with you, which... Um, it's quite sad because um, it's, it's a film I'm looking forward to seeing. Um, as you said, we've got to wait another week before its release. Um, but I think in the next couple of weeks, two, three weeks' time, um, I'll go along to the cinema, probably myself, to watch this. Um, I'm very interested in the story and um, the cast as well is very impressive. Yes. Well, certainly I'm reading Forbes as well, Stephen. They're always a great website for discussing box office performance. And it did say it had the biggest debut of the weekend by default. So I don't know what that means. I think they brought this forward a little bit for the, the Labour Day release because it's a day where uh, older audience members tend to go out and watch films. And I think that was very deliberate because obviously they know their target demographic and who's going to be more interested in going and seeing this film. Uh, but they say it earned 1.76 million on Friday while keeping in, as I did say earlier, at 1,800 theatres, which would point to a Friday-Sunday frame of $5.97 million dollars. A Friday Monday weekend of seven point six million dollars and a a Wednesday and Monday debut of nine point four million dollars. They say it's no King's Ransom, but it's pretty close to the handful of adult skewing thrillers that focus features used to put on this weekend, put out on this weekend. So 
Yeah, it's nowhere near the, the bigger hitters. Uh, I think the Crazy Rich Asians is one of the bigger ones in the box office over there just now. So it's doing okay for the, the type of film. It's, it cost $24 million to produce. Uh, and I think they're saying it's going to need legs overseas to boost it. Uh, I don't know if it will get it, Stephen. I hope it does pop up <laughs> the UK box office because I like to see films, uh, period pieces like this, getting a little bit of limelight shun on them. We can't forget history. We need to go back and read and see films about these despicable people uh, to really not rewrite history again and again and again. We've seen a lot of rising and right-wing politics in the likes of Germany recently and that's uh, disturbing. So we want to see uh, films like this coming out and getting the, the attention it deserves. Yeah, John, I mean, I, I think we've lost count of the amount of films that have been made during this period, but mm. one of the things I do enjoy about these type of movies is the more character-based yeah. films like Darkest Hour spring to mind. I thoroughly enjoyed <laughs> that movie at the end of last year. Uh, Downfall is another one from yeah. about 10 years ago. I thought that was an amazing film. But you also get the, the ones like Saving Private Ryan and uh, Dunkirk's as well, which are more showpiece, more grand. The whole scope of how big an event it was in, in world history. Um, but this movie, I think, um, it intrigues me in that way that it's more character based. Yeah. Um, certainly very interested uh, in Oscar Isaac's character as well and um, how he'll perform in this movie. Ben Kingsley, uh, you know what you're going to get with him anyway. He's a fantastic actor, has been for the last 40 odd years. And um, I don't think he's going to let us down with this one either. No, certainly I agree with you, Stephen. That's the final thing I will say. That he also in the trailers, you've seen the manipulation of Eitman on his character. He was trying to get him around to his side. I don't think it'll work, because history, we know, it didn't work. He was trialled, then they ended him. But certainly you're completely right. That's the final thing I'll touch on in this topic, Stephen. These films uh, set in this period, they tend to be quite wide in scale, and they overlook the human tragedy and just uh, what the scale of it, the murdering that happened in that time period. Uh, they look and they kind of a, they almost glorify some of the events. So it's great to see a character-driven film like this showing some of the atrocities that were committed with these absolute gits. But we're going to move on to the next topic, and it's all about the trailer of Why Are We Creative? It's a documentary featuring uh, the likes of David Bowie, Quentin Tarantino, Angelina Jolie, even Stephen Hawkins in there. So uh, it's a very intriguing uh, film or documentary. This is by Herman Vasky, I believe his name is. Uh, this is a guy that's been globetrotting for 30 years and flinging mics in the face of some of the, the biggest names in the entertainment business and outside the entertainment business asking them why they're creative uh, trailer was okay best thing from Stephen for me was that bloody guitar riff I thought that was incredible it was almost like a uh, better call soul but yeah it was intriguing there's over 50 candid interviews as I did say I went through a few of them I'll let you go through the other ones uh, it's, not, it's interesting, it's very arty. You just linked it to something Yoko Ono would do, and in fact, she's in this. Yeah, uh, I've got to be honest, John, the trailer didn't really intrigue me. Um, <laughs> it just looks, I mean, it seems like a very fortunate man. Uh, he's a German yeah. filmmaker, uh, Mr. Vasca, and uh, it seems like a very fortunate man that's just um, turned up at the door of very famous people and asked them <laughs> with the one question uh, why are we creative? And um, it kind of works in a way, I suppose. You know, it's. I don't, I don't know if I could sit down and listen yeah. to 50 interviews from um, Bono and Peter Ustinov and the Dalai Lama. Um, I don't know. I, I, it's one of those movies I'll probably give a chance. Um, I was actually, when I saw this article coming up on ScreenDaily.com, um, I was very interested to, to see what it was about. After watching the trailer, slightly disheartened. Um, it was a bit <laughs> disappointing, to be honest with you. Um, I think it's just going to be a ret- repetitive yeah. process where he turns up at Diane Kruger's door and asks why are we creative turns up at the Dakota to speak to Yoko Ono and ask the same question Nobody etc Yoshi, and uh, I suppose um, if you're into that type of thing I think it's it's very artsy um, yeah. you know that last clip with Stephen Hawkins <laughs> as well um, asking him that question um, the likes of Tarantino I think was stumped he was just about to get into some premiere and they thought it was a very difficult question to ask um, it's a very simple question um, you know when you read it but I think if you're asking these people with these creative minds yeah. it can be very um, mind boggling to them I suppose because they want to delve right into their own minds to find out how you know how they tick and stuff like that and I think yeah. that was probably what stumped Tarantino a little bit um, do I really want to know about Bono and why he's so creative Mm, don't know. Um, Nick Cave 
quite interested in him actually. How, yeah. you know, uh, Angelina Jolie. You know, a lot of people would probably see her as um, you know an actress, but you've got to remember a lot of these um, actors, the likes of Angelina Jolie, George Clooney. Um, Michael Douglas, etc. They're all producers as well. Um, you know, they've all got their own production companies. So, in a way, um, you know, they're very creative. You know, I think a lot of us just um, see that sort of one-dimensional side to them. Uh, they're actors. They read the script, do their scenes, and move on. Uh, turn up at the red carpet, etc. But what they're doing in the background, um, the likes of these actors, they've all got their own production companies. Uh, you see, the likes of Demi Moore's been, you know, a producer for so many years. Um, likes of Michael Douglas as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can see that being quite interesting from that side. I would, I would like to see the likes of, more like, the likes of Angelina Jolie and, and some of the actors I just mentioned to see um, why they're so creative because I don't think we see that side. And the likes of Yoko Ono, Bono, uh, the Dalai Lama in there as well. Um, <laughs> it's kind of cliche a little bit, um, but Jimmy Page as well. Those ones are more obvious. I, I would like to see the ones where you would naturally just assume they're not that very creative and find out why they are. Yeah, I can't wait to watch this film. I'm not going to go and see this film in the cinema, incidentally. That's not going to happen. I'm not even going to waste an unlimited card going to see it. This is one that I will maybe see if it comes up in uh, Netflix. It's a documentary. These type of documentaries are always interesting. This is a guy's life work. <laughs> He's meant to be a German filmmaker. He spent 30 years putting a, a mic in these people's faces what the hell has he been doing out with his time you a filmmaker and he spent 30 years doing this Jesus Christ he's passionate about it if nothing else you're completely right Stephen it's a question that seems to be stumping them it's not something that would stump the general person in the public uh, because they they, <laughs> they just give it a black and white answer but these people you need to understand this is their life's work this is what's driven them for their entire careers they're very creative minded they wouldn't have made it to the scale that they have in their careers the likes of Tarantino Bowie, I mean Bowie, I'd love to hear that guy's answer to that question why he's creative, because this is a guy that reimagined himself time and time again, I mean there's maybe four or five eras of Bowie, the likes of the Ziggy Stardust era through to the Thin White Duke and, and on and on and on it's just an incredible guy who reinvented himself again and again, Yoko Ono I'd love to see her answer that question she's also an abstract artist writing yes uh, and tiny, tiny things you need a magnifying glass to see. And uh, the likes of the Dalai Lama, I don't know how the hell he's creative in any way whatsoever. I thought he was a religious leader, but maybe he has in his own way, get a creative side to him, Stephen Hawkins. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a creative side to him as well, Stephen. I don't think he went back that far, so I'd like to speak to Adolf. But yeah, I mean, it's an intriguing concept. It is very artsy. The trailer struck me for the musical side of it more than anything. It'll be something I'll... Maybe have a look at it if it pops up in a streaming service, but I'm not going to go and watch it. I don't think it's something that's going to hit off with the, the wider audience. But you never know. These documentaries can either explode or they'll just sink. Hopefully it explodes for this guy because it's uh, 30 years of hard work and I hope he gets his just desserts out of it. But we're going to move on to the next topic. It's very quick. A show. And the next topic is all about Chris Hemsworth to lead Russo Brothers scripted Netflix thriller. I'll let you in to give us... Some information on this, Stephen. What have you done with that? Yeah, you know, according to THR, this is a series called Daka John, and it tells of a weary mercenary named Rake, who Hemsworth plays, who's hired to save the son of a businessman in India. Um, you know, as you said, this is going to be a, another series um, on the streaming channel. Um, funnily enough, um, this has been a common theme for this show, actually, John. We're talking about television series, mm-hmm. um, something that we don't really do that often. I think the last time we did was for Cobra Kai, because it's connected to the Karate Kid films. And in a way, you know, it is certainly connected to um, the, the movie business through the Russo brothers and their relationship, uh, not only with Chris Hemsworth, but um, a, a Apparently, um, the stunt coordinator on this television series it was also the stunt double for Chris Evans in the both Avengers films, The Avengers and Captain America Civil War. Yeah. Um, I think this is going to be... Um, the theme to this reminds me, just reading the synopsis of um, the, the, the television series, it's going to be very John Wick. Mm. And that's the kind of vibe I'm getting from it. I think it's going to be um, interesting to see how Chris Hemsworth performs in this. Um, I'm so used to seeing him on the cinematic screen. To see him on our television screens in a television series is another thing, um, especially when it's going to be episodic. Um, see how he deals with that. 
I'm very interested to see how this goes. Um, you know, I'm subscribed to Netflix anyway, so hopefully we do get this over here in the UK and there's not going to be any embargoes on this like we do with a lot of things that are on Netflix uh, thanks to our friend Rupert Murdoch. No, I'm not getting to Rupert again. I spoke about that guy in depth over a lot of episodes. I can't stand him. He's a git. But yeah, it's an intriguing concept, Steve, and it's... Uh, it's set in the title, a city of Dakar, Bangladesh, and apparently he's playing some hired hand that will go and save uh, a businessman's son who's been kidnapped and is also in Dakar. It's uh, certain zone, centre zone, hands off, he's uh, playing a mercenary. And it's an interesting concept, it's not certainly not something I would have thought uh, Chris would have thrust himself into, but it's fair play to him, he's trying to open up his career a little bit. Uh, not be tight cast as far. I think it may be a bit late for that, sadly, but hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully not. Hopefully he goes and does this and it thrusts him uh, into a new role that we can all say, wow, he's so multi-talented and such great range. Who he, knows? He did do- play the secretary in the Ghostbusters film. He did play the secretary and I never went to see that film because it starred a certain Melissa McCarthy, who I hate, uh, but <laughs> I don't hate her. That's harsh. <laughs> I don't hate her. I don't know her. I don't like a film, so yeah, I'm going to see it here. But yeah, I mean, they do, they say it's a similar situation to Keanu Reeves' John Wick's in its direct, which was directed by Reeves' Matrix stunt double, Chad Stahelski. This one is going to be directed, I believe, by uh, Chris Evans' stunt double. Uh, so yeah, I think it will It'll be quite high octane, Stephen, quite quick paced, hopefully. Uh, it's going to be a treat on the eyes. Um, Hopefully. I don't know anything about it. I'm just reading about it just now. But uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that it's going to be directed by a stunt coordinator in double way, it's, you, you know you're, what you're going to get. You're going to get something that's close to his heart. It's going to be quick paced, like the John Wick series. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see it. It's going to begin shooting, I believe, in November until March in India and Indonesia. Uh, and it's going to be set for a May 2019 release. So I'll be keeping a very close eye on this one. But certainly looking at Deadline's take on it, Stephen, uh, it says that he's a physically brave but an emotional coward. Uh, the man has to come to terms with his own identity and sense of self. So this is going to be one of these ones where it's hopefully full of action, superficially amazing, but we're going to get a deeper uh, undertone of things going on. Uh, and uh, and that's going to play into great for Hensworth because I hope he will show these acting chops in this new project. But yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think the fact that it's on the streaming service as well, John, I think it's going to have a degree of violence in it. Um, I, I think, so. I do think it's a it's a great platform for these uh, television series to air on. It's, certainly in the these Marvel television series, there's a lot of violence in these, um, bit of gore, but it's the way it's shot. You know, it's um, they can get away with it. Yeah. I think this is not going to be any different. Uh, in regards to it being very much the same sort of style as John Wick. Um, I don't think it will go, you know, the full booner on the violence as the as the John Wick films do, mm-hmm. but certainly um, I think it's going to be a, an interesting concept. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to it. I'll give it a go. Yeah, and it's just interesting to see the the Russos expanding out after uh, the Avengers. Team. It'll be intriguing to see mm-hmm. what they come up with with this one. Also, they're writing it; they're not actually directing it, but. Yeah, I think we're moving on, Stephen, to the next topic, and it's kind of a continuing the Marvel theme. It's all about Kevin Feige being honoured by the Producers Guild of America. He's uh, he's getting the he's going to be the recipient of the 2019 David O. Selznick Achievement Award, and I have to say it's much deserved. This guy's one of the he's, he's now became one of the greatest producers of all time, certainly for his work over the last decade in creating the MCU and what it is. Just a masterful job he's done, making us all come into fruition what uh, a guy is yeah and you look at the long list of producers that have uh, won this award I didn't know anything about this award John uh, to be honest with you but um, it's, it's obviously to recognise a producer's body of work in motion pictures and when you look at the long list of producers and the likes of Christopher Nolan Kathleen Kennedy Frank Marshall uh, Brian Grazer uh, Steven Spielberg and Clint Eastwood are in there as well which is very impressive uh, Jerry Bruckheimer a uh, legendary name as well. Uh, the list goes on. Um, I think it's not before time. I think, um, particularly in the last ten or so years, Kevin Feige really has um, he's really get made those Marvel characters very credible in the cinematic yeah. releases. Um, you've got to go back to a time before that to really appreciate what this guy's done for this franchise. Um, you look at the likes of the nineteen ninety Captain America films. There's a few bad. Daredevil ones maybe about 15 years ago Elektra, terrible uh, there was a long list of them 
uh, The Incredible Hulk had a few TV movies. Spider-Man had a few TV movies as well. It just wasn't really moving in the, the direction that these uh, characters deserved. This man's came in. Um, he's just shook everything up. His directorial choices as well. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's made a bad choice um, yet. I don't think he will either. I think he's got a good eye for talent. Yes. Um, certainly some of the directors that have came up over the last few years I'd never heard of. This man clearly does know what he, he wants from his directors. And the diversity as well yeah. um, within uh, these movies, the opportunities he's given um, is very commendable. I think um, he's certainly um, a very modern way thinking man. And um, I think he thoroughly deserves this accolade. Um, I think it's been long overdue. Um, to have him up there with the likes of Spielberg, Eastwood, uh, Kennedy and Marshall partnership as well, Bruckheimer, I think it's very impressive. He's certainly um, up there with those producers. And I'm very interested to see um, where he takes his next and the next phase of the Marvel films. Yeah. Yeah, I can't wait as well, Stephen. As you do see, he's a fairly fitting recipient of this award. Uh, you just look at not just the, the success he's managed to accomplish with the, the MCU, crossing $17.6 billion cumulatively worldwide at the box office. That is just incredible, that figure. The amount of money he's brought in. But it's not even about the money. It's the the way that he's managed to take these characters, uh, some of which a lot of people wouldn't have known anything about. These aren't big headliner superhero characters, the likes of... Ant-Man, Black Panther, these are small-time characters. And the way he's managed to create success with them, certainly when you look at the likes of DC and their continual failure, they could be doing with a guy like uh, Kevin Feige. They've got big show-stopping superhero characters and they just fail time and again. He's took smaller characters and he's created absolute magic. And as you did touch upon the diversity as well, Stephen, giving the likes of Ryan Coogler uh, a chance to helm Black Panther and the success that had practically an all-black African-American cast, making that an absolute success, giving the likes of Taika Waititi a chance at directing a big blockbuster film. And it's easy to forget that with DC bringing out Wonder Woman first, that he was actually uh, the first person probably to go for a female-led superhero film with uh, Captain Marvel. They had that in place, plans for that in place before Wonder Woman, and that's coming out also with Brie Larson helming that. So this is a guy that's gave opportunity and chances to people of all different... Uh, racial ethnicities and uh, he's brought in diverse casts again and again and again so hats off to him thoroughly deserves it one of the all time great producers uh, for what he's accomplished with the NCU and this is a guy that's came from nothing and worked his absolute balls off to get there so thoroughly deserving yeah and we're going to move on to our next topic John this is in regards to Danny Boyle who we covered uh, a few weeks ago and has um, stepping away from the James Bond project Bond 25 um, he's got his sights on a musical comedy involving the only person in the world to remember the Beatles um, that sounds like a world I don't want to live in um, because I certainly cannot go a day without listening to Beatles music no. don't know about yourself John no. but uh, yeah it's an, it's an interesting uh, article on SlashFilm.com and it's uh, it's a it's a film that's going to star musician Ed Sheeran who <laughs> plays himself, and basically the interview it's it's really Ed Sheeran getting interviewed in regards to the part he's going to play. It's still an entitled musical comedy, so it's going to be very interesting what it's going to be called. I think somewhere down the line it may be called something you know after a Beatles title or something like that. You know, like very much like that uh, musical it was out maybe about ten fifteen years ago across the universe. Hopefully it'll be a lot better than that. But this, you know, the, the likes of, um, you know, Ed Sheeran, and it also stars Hamish Patel, who I think is playing the main character in this movie, yes. if I'm not mistaken, John. Yes, he played Tam Wama's suit in EastEnders, I remember him. Uh, sadly, I was forced to watch EastEnders when he was playing quite a prominent part in it. And I think he's going to be the chap who for remembers, the only chap that remembers the Beatles. Uh, Ed Sheeran's playing himself, I believe. It's going to be set in this generation. I think there was misunderstanding. I think people thought it was going to be set in the 60s or 70s, but that would be ridiculous because obviously the Beatles were really prominent then. And how the hell can people forget about the Beatles that close to them being so successful? Yeah, Uh, exactly, yeah. Uh, So I think it's going to be set in the millennial generation. People have forgot about the Beatles. I don't know how this is going to play out. Is it going to be a wide-ranging amnesia, bout of amnesia? I don't know. But it's an interesting and bizarre concept. I remember hearing about this a few months back. But yeah, Hamish Patel is going to be playing the character who remembers the Beatles 
Yeah, and he somehow uses their music to thrust himself into a career in music. He obviously, he's got some voice then because he's managing to hit Paul McCartney's notes, George Harrison's notes. Uh, always underrated, Georgie boy. Uh, his backing vocals are unbelievable at times. He's going to hit Lennon's notes, and somehow he's going to get people to do the low notes of Ringo's. So I don't know how he's managing this one guy doing four distinct voices and parts and songs, but he is. He uses um, music to garner success for himself and Ed Sheeran somehow uh, goes along in this journey he says in uh, the quotes that Patel plays a character who wakes up to discover he's the only person on the planet who remembers the music of the Beatles so he uses those songs to become a superstar musician himself and he goes on to elaborate that and then I discover him and take him on tour then he gets much much bigger than me through doing stuff yeah it's very clever I got to actually kind of learn how to act with the Game of Thrones thing but that was literally me popping in for a day and making a cameo Oh, Bastard the Executioner was me popping uh, in for a day, but this was like full days on sets, like 12 hours a day. So he's playing himself, he takes this guy on tour, he remembers the Beatles though, brings out all their stuff for the first time for people hearing it, and then he becomes a, mix, a bigger success in Sheen, which wouldn't be hard. <laughs> what would, because he's some success now. I don't think we're going to actually hear any of the original uh, recordings from the Beatles, oh. John. I think that would be too costly. I remember um, there was an interview back in 2003 when uh, I Am Sam was released the Sean Penn movie yeah. the Michelle Pfeiffer a great movie um, and I remember they were um, very much heavily in talks with George Harrison um, in the production of this movie uh, prior to his death and I think he was going to give them their blessing to use the original um, uh, recordings from the Beatles but I think it turned out that um, the cost of it cost more than the actual movie itself to, to just have some of uh, the Beatles songs in there so what they did was they got other artists in to record these songs and it was, a, it was a thoroughly enjoyable soundtrack this time I think the likes of uh, Hamish Patel will cover these tracks anyway um, because this is part of the story he's claiming these songs are going to be his anyway Um I'm quite interested in it because of the, the Beatles take on it as well. Um, I think it's uh, quite an interesting concept. Um, it's going to, uh, I think it does say it's it's going to work like an episode of the Twilight Zone. That was certainly something that popped into my head. I think that's the only way you can really get your head around something um, s- something so bizarre that the, the rest of the world don't remember the Beatles. It certainly sounds like an episode of the Twilight Zone, but I'll give this a shot. I think it's an untitled movie is aiming for a release in September 2019, so we're still another year away from yeah. its release. I'm sure there'll be a title coming out very soon. Um, it's good to see Danny Boyle's back making uh, what he likes doing as well. Um, the whole... Bond thing probably left a, a sour taste in his mouth with all the internal politics of that project and uh, it's just good to see him back doing what he does best. Yeah and uh, he's, it's done apparently so in post production so yeah as you do say very interesting concept Stephen taking arguably the greatest band of all time for me there's no argument they are the greatest band of all time the best and the only people since the great composers and back in the heydays of classical music to change structures of music they're the greatest uh, but taking them and having people forgetting all about them, that's a very interesting concept and the one I will be watching. But we're going to move on to the final topic, Stephen, which is all about Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, leading with uh, the same actor who plays Charles Manson on a TV show. I don't know what the TV show is, but you'll tell me in a minute. Yeah, John, this is uh, Damon Herriman. Uh, as you said, he's been cast to play Charles Manson, not once but twice. Uh, first in Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and the other being in the television series Mindhunter. This is something that's not really that unusual. Um, I think perhaps if um, you know a certain actor can capture the essence, not necessarily look exactly like the person they're playing, then it does work. I think in this case, perhaps uh, Tarantino's talent picked him out of this television series and you know, sized him up to be the man for the job. Mm-hmm. It's something that's not really that unusual. I, I do remember an actor, uh, a British actor called Gary Bakewell, who um, played Paul McCartney in the movie Backbeat from 1994. Yeah. And he went on to play Paul McCartney again. His likeness was actually very similar, but his actual mannerisms uh, were, were absolutely bang on. And he went, to play, he went on to play um, Paul McCartney again in the television movie The Linda McCartney Story from 2000. Um, so it's not an unusual thing. Um, in regards to the actor himself, I'm not really familiar with Herriman at all, but certainly, you know, if Tarantino's... Um, you know, Cherry picked him out of a television series playing the same person, uh, in this case, Charles Manson. 
Um, it's very interesting to see how this will fit in. Um, I don't really know too much about his film work, how that's going to really transfer over to a cinematic film. But um, it's very interesting to see. We're starting to see more and more of pieces of information coming out about Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This is another little snippet. Um, I think this is actually quite big news, actually, because the whole story is based around that period and, you know, that terrible time during those murders. Um, so for, for this announcement to come out that Damon Herriman is going to be playing Charles Manson, um, it's quite big news. It's probably one of the big... Um, stories of this movie's sort of the, the build up to it and um, I'm just looking forward to seeing it. I think as well in turn this might help people switch over to this television series as well too. Yeah. I, I think if they enjoy his performance in the, the film, um, I think this might give the television series Mindhunter a new found audience. Yes, uh, I, I look at the photos of him Stephen I have to say, I can't lie. I don't think he has any resemblance whatsoever to the real Charles Manson oh you did touch upon it when we spoke about that before coming on why the hell would you want to look like Charles Manson a bigger oddity of a man you will never ever find he's got psychotic looking eyes and that's probably because he was on all sorts of drugs at just about every point in the day in his life before he get jailed and then subsequently died recently rotten hell you got uh, but yeah listen doesn't need to look like him he looks more like Jon Snow in uh, Game of Thrones but certainly when he flicks the hair back and most of the greasy look he does look a little bit more like him as to why you'd want to play him again I don't really know certainly I'd never want to get into the mind of this man but he, clearly he's done a very good job I've never seen the series uh, but if he's impressed Tarantino enough to bring him on board then certainly he's done a very good job but yeah just looking at some of the, the information that's come out about this film Stephen it's, again it's just got my anticipation ever higher the photos that have been getting released uh, certainly that of Brad Pitt next to Leonardo DiCaprio and of uh, Margot Robbie put as Sharon Tate. Uh, they, they look amazing. The periods, costumes look incredible. And I love the comments of Tarantino talking about uh, the dynamic of Pratt and DiCaprio, uh, how it's the best dynamic between the two leading actors since Paul Newman and Robert Redford. That's just got my anticipation ever higher because two of my favourite actors and certainly some of the films they were in are some of my favourites from that time. Uh, so I can't wait to see how these two guys interconnect. Certainly I think uh, DiCaprio's character... Uh, Rick Dalton is apparently the, name, the neighbour of Sharon Tate in this film and it's going to focus on how the deaths, the gruesome deaths of uh, Tate and obviously the entourage she had with her at the time, how that's going to impact on his career in Hollywood and they're saying it's going to act as like a sort of allegory for the, the literal takeover of Hollywood by the mainstream America's fears of 60s youth movement so that's quite cool uh, so I can't wait to see the film can't wait to see this guy's performance. I think he's probably going to... I don't know if it is going to be the key to the film because if it's going to focus more on Dalton, the character of Rick Dalton, his stunt double and how it's going to impact them, then maybe it'll just be a side issue to a, the grander scale of that year. But certainly getting this guy on board that's played the character before might be a good move. Yeah, I'll just add one more thing, John. I think you're right. I, th- I don't think the film is going to focus entirely on this. I think yeah. it's going to be a, a you know a, a story that's running parallel with those events. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to focus too heavily on them. Yes, we know that Margot Robbie's playing you know the the unfortunate role of of Sharon Tate. I don't know what her capacity will be in this movie. To be honest with you, I don't know if it's going to be a big part or not. Um, certainly wanted to have a big name involved with that ca- uh, that casting anyway, but I think I, I don't think it's going to delve right into those events. I don't think that's really uh, where Tarantino will, will take this. I could be wrong, but I don't think it would have that much of appeal to, as a movie. I think it sounds pretty depressing if that's yeah. what he's going to do. I don't think he is. I think it's going to be mostly maybe about eighty percent of a, a sort of sub story running parallel with those events. Yeah, that's what it does best, Stephen. Multiple perspectives all coming in and intermingling in, uh, in a period piece. Uh, I just can't wait to see the Dakota fan and all the other people playing the Dunham and Austin Butler and stuff playing the, the Manson family. I can't wait to see. It's going to be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, Bruce Lee and Steve McQueen and all sorts in there. So it's going to be a fantastic film and I can't wait to see it. Regardless of who's playing Manson, you know it's going to be magic with Tarantino involved. But that just brings us to the end of this week's Movie Burner News. Uh, we'd just like to thank you for listening to us once again and we'll be back tomorrow with a movie burner blog remember guys if you enjoyed that episode then do hit that like button comment below and maybe subscribe to the channel if you haven't done already 
If you want to follow us on social media for all the latest updates for Movie Burner Entertainment, then we can be found on Twitter and Facebook at Movie Burners. You can also listen to us on Google Play and iTunes at the Movie Burner Podcast. And last but not least, if you want to access all the latest written reviews and the occasional article, then that can be found on our website at movieburnerentertainment.org. Until the next time, goodbye.